Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here in State College with Ernest Eby. And Ernest, you've been involved with various ministries over the years and you do, you're involved in a church plant here in State College. And one of the things that I know you're passionate about is church planting, especially indigenous church planting right here in North America. What does the New Testament teach us about planting new churches? What is a good model that you feel we should be using? Well, it might be good to first clarify that the New Testament does not tell us or instruct us to plant churches. It tells us to make disciples. The assumption is that these disciples will gather together into assemblies and churches. So the first churches to be planted outside of Jerusalem happened as a result of persecution in Jerusalem. And as people scattered because of persecution, they preached the word everywhere they went. And churches sprang up in these regions and countries where these Christians moved. This is sometimes referred to as the colonization model. So then in Acts 13, we read about some prophets and teachers from Antioch sending Barnabas and Paul to make disciples throughout Asia. And wherever they went, they brought disciples together in assemblies. And these assemblies were the church then in that region. After a number of months or years, Paul and Barnabas would return to these new groups of disciples and appoint leaders in these churches. And this is sometimes referred to as the indigenous model. So I believe that both models are good. Each have their unique benefits and challenges, but God used both of them in the New Testament to expand his kingdom. Can you compare and contrast the model that Anabaptists use here in America compared to the models that they use for trying to plant churches in other countries, especially foreign missions? What's the differences there? Well, in North America, the swarm model, or the hiving off model, as it's sometimes called, it's a reference to bees starting new colonies, mm -hmm. is frequently used by a conservative Anabaptist. This is when a new church is started nearby to the mother church. Nobody really has to move that much, kind of just go off the side here and start a new church. Sometimes the colonization model is used when a nucleus of families packs up their things, moves to a different area to plant a church maybe some other part of the continent, it may be another country. It's very rare for conservative Anabaptists to attempt indigenous church planting. Of course, indigenous were not really indigenous people, the Native Americans were. But it's, it's rare for them to attempt indigenous church planting in North America. I'm not aware of any surviving plain Anabaptist churches in North America that are comprised of mostly formerly unchurched local indigenous people in an area. When conservative Anabaptists plant churches in other countries, they sometimes use the colonization model, but there have been a number of successful indigenous church plants around the world by conservative Anabaptists. It's not that we haven't done it anywhere, but we just don't do it here in America. So why is that? Like, why, why the differences? I mean, why hasn't that happened here in, in this country as, as much, at least? There's probably a number of factors. Primary factor is probably that we just haven't ever done it that way before. <laughs> which is the way we do a lot of things. Okay, well, so then that, that brings another question. So what might church planting look like if we would take more of the Paul and Barnabas uh, approach or, or their model that they use in Acts? That's a good question. So I would envision an established church blessing or sending a few people to another area of the continent to make disciples and start a church. And then once that new church is established, these church planters would move on to another area or maybe use that area as their base to reach out into surrounding areas. Basically, the locals that, that would come to Christ in that area would then be given charge of that church at, at some point. That's right. So then, uh, this is the question I have then, so what, what advantage do you see to that approach compared to, say, what we're a little more used to doing or more um, standard ways of how we do church? So both models have their advantages and disadvantages. If the majority of people in a church are from the local area, it will be easier for them to take ownership of the church and they will really want to see it succeed. It's hard for most locals to get enthused about a church in which the majority of the people in the church are from a different area or a different culture, especially if they're running the church. Another advantage is the potential for multiplication. First generation Christians and those who begin taking Jesus' teachings very seriously are quite eager to tell their relatives and friends about the news of the kingdom of God. And if they're enthused about the church, it's their church, they own it, they're going to be more likely to want to bring their friends and relatives to the church. And maybe their fellow employees 
of the people that they interact with. So if these new Christians are equipped for planting churches, multiplication can happen more rapidly. Better and more healthy growth, basically. That, that's right. Mm -hmm. So what unique challenges do you see with this particular approach? When solid Anabaptist churches attempt the swarm or the colonization model, the new church plan is almost always going to be successful. A number of families move into the new community, the church is established, regardless of whether any local people are integrated or not. I would contend that such a church is only partially successful. In some of the most important ways, such a church is probably dysfunctional. So the challenge with indigenous church planning is to actually get a church off the ground and get it established. You don't have many people moving in, and sometimes those attempting these efforts are going to get burnt out, or they're going to get discouraged, and so the church never takes root. So that's one of the unique challenges of uh, indigenous church planning. Another challenge is that many Anabaptists who are looking for a different church experience than the one they currently have might take an interest in this new church plant. Anytime there's a new outreach church or a fresh vision for church planting, there's dozens of people who would like to become part of something that appears more alive. And if the church plant is only a few hours drive from their friends and relatives, it's going to attract a lot of people who would not be willing to move thousands of miles away. But the problem is that having too many people join an indigenous church planting effort can keep the indigenous church from ever being established. The church ends up being a collection of transplants from other areas, and the leaders of the church end up pastoring and discipling the people who are moving in from other areas rather than the local people. I'm really curious, what kind of response do you get from conservative Anabaptists when you share this vision with them? Like, yeah, how, how, do they, how do they look at this model that you're presenting? Uh, that's an interesting question. Many people think it sounds like a good idea, but they're rather skeptical. Nearly all conservative Anabaptist attempts at indigenous church planting in North America the last 150 years, maybe, have either compromised on scriptural teaching or the church has completely died out. So many people feel like North America is a hard place to reach people for Christ, and it is, and they're ready to give up before you even try. Many people don't like the idea of asking Anabaptists to wait to move into a new area until the church is mostly comprised of local people. Here and there, I'm sensing an openness to this vision, so that's very encouraging. Are there present-day examples of this model being implemented by Anabaptists? And if so, what's, what are the results? What have you observed? There's a few people who are attempting it presently, but they're just getting started, so we don't really have a long-term um, thing to go by. Um, I would look more to the evangelicals probably to see people who've been doing it for a longer period of time. I heard of one church planter who is not Anabaptist who is using the indigenous church planting model in the northern part of this continent. And his goal is to plant a new church every five years. For the first year or two, after he moves into the city, he is supported by other local churches. Local churches are willing to support him in starting a new church in their city whenever they realize that he's working among the unchurched people and rather than taking members away from their churches. And then once the new church becomes self-supporting for about three years, then he moves on to the next city and does it all back over again. This is just one man, but there are many people in the evangelical community who are planting small churches like this among unchurched people in cities. Uh, some will start a number of small gatherings in a city, and then once a month they'll bring these all together for a larger assembly just to give them more fellowship. Maybe one of these days we'll have some stories of Anabaptists, conservative Anabaptists are doing this in North America. That's my hope and dream and prayer. So what would you say to those people who are seeing this and saying, okay, I want to do that. I want to take steps in helping plant indigenous churches right here in America. What would you say to them and what do you think they should take as their first step? Probably the first thing to do is to begin praying and fasting. Pray for the heart throb of God that all people would be saved and no one would perish. And pray that God would move in the church, my church, your church, that he would open doors for leaders to catch this vision. I've been amazed at the doors that God has opened over the years for myself and our family as we've waited on him. People blessed us in ways that most people would have considered an impossibility. So I believe that prayer is very important and it's not a negotiable thing. It, it is foundational. All good works of God come out of people getting serious with the Lord in, in prayer. Another thing that a person has interest in church planning might want to do is be an intern at some other urban church before moving to where they want to help plant a church. Uh, we had the opportunity to do that in Meadville before moving to State College. 
I just went to some pastors and asked them if I could be an intern. They didn't really have any programs set up as such, but they said they'd be glad to include me with anything they could, and I found that to be a very valuable experience. So that's something I've encouraged for others. I would say learn and prepare as much as you can in advance. You'll need every bit of that that you can get. Some of us have recently launched a new website. It's churchplantersforum.org, and this website has many hours of audio sermons and other resources that relate directly to church planting, and these are resources by conservative Anabaptists. If people are interested in church planting, I would encourage them to attend the annual Church Planters Forum and Retreat at Penn Valley in central Pennsylvania. That happens in the middle of June. We've been coordinating that now for about six years. You can find more details at our website. That's Okay, I didn't know about that event. That's really exciting to hear that that's been going. Is it pretty popular? It is. We generally have people signing up well in advance, and it's full by the time we're ready to start. Maybe people watching this will have, you know, a thousand shoppers. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, only, we cut it off at 200, so we're starting, <laughs> we're, bad, everybody. we're starting to plan additional events for all the people that can't come. Maybe do it twice a year or something. <laughs> That's really amazing. So yes, there's definitely some big hurdles to indigenous church planning in North America, but I don't think these hurdles should discourage us. I would like to see dozens of teams working in different places all across the continent attempting this vision until we find a way to reach people right here in North America. We need multiple teams who are willing to spend their life and die trying to reach North Americans and bring them into the church. The uh, good side about North American church planting is that if we live close to other New Testament churches, within a few hours drive we can experience the blessings of fellowship with these other Christians without needing to take a year furlough every few years like you would in a maybe in a foreign country. So if we can stand on the shoulders of those who have learned something about reaching North Americans for Christ, and if we're humble enough to build on the wisdom of each other, I'm confident that God will bless our efforts and that this indigenous church planting vision can become a reality here in North America. Thank you so much for sharing and being on this episode. And, and uh, yeah, I think this is a really powerful vision. I really hope our listeners and viewers will take this and be inspired to implement it in their own towns and cities or wherever they live. Um, so yes, thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate it.